Hello and welcome to the AIM webinar series. My name is Mike Allen and I serve AIM Inc. as their member engagement manager. AIM is the trusted worldwide industry association for the automatic identification industry. For nearly half a century, AIM has provided unbiased information, educational resources, and standards to providers and users of these technologies. AIM membership provides access to an insider's perspective on trends and opportunities, along with a voice in shaping the growth and future of the industry. AIM member benefits include education, advocacy and community, as well as a role in creating industry standards through collaboration. AIM is an investment in your future. Before the presentation starts, I would like to discuss with you a few housekeeping items. First, you'll notice you are muted throughout the presentation. Please do not use the raise hand option during this webinar presentation. If you have any questions during the webinar, please click the chat icon on the top right of your screen. After this, you'll see a chat dialog box at the bottom right of your screen. Make sure in the Send To box you select AIM Inc. and then in the box below type your question. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can after the presentation. Today's presenter is Mr. RFID himself, Lowry's IoT, RF, and Blockchain Solutions architect, John Greaves. John, take it away. Thank you very much, Michael, and a very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, take the first opportunity. We wish you a very happy Thanksgiving holiday, and thank you for the time out at probably a most critical uh, turkey preparation uh, time of the day preceding the holiday. We hope that in uh, listening to our presentation, you will derive some value, some benefits, some information that can help you guide your way through the Internet of Things and all that that supposedly encompasses. How did we arrive at this title, at this, at this opportunity for uh, basically an AIM Lowry educational outreach? It is really the sum of information provided to AIM and to Lowry solution client base that continually and, um, reinforced but many people do not understand the term AIDC, Automatic Identification and Data Capture, nor actually what makes it up. Many, many years ago, it was very simple, of course. There was barcode and that was it. But as technologies and technology platforms have evolved and AIDC has grasped more and more of them, our AIM, for instance, and Lowry Solutions is a part of, the U.S. tag to ISO IEC SC31 in the matter of RFID and barcode. Um, we are also participants in TC122 uh, with MH10 uh, for packaging and labeling. So um, all of these characteristics, all of these standards, these norms, and these technologies, optical, optical character recognition, RFID, RTLS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, there's such a proliferation now, all of them living under this rather wonderful title of AIDC, but what is AIDC, I suppose? It means that um, in the IoT, item level identification and above, is significantly requiring a talking identifier. Your desk and chair, your suit, your tie, your skirt will not jump off the rack and launch itself into a packing line and tell you that it's supposedly going to go to John Greaves or Mary Smith or Tom Jones. Um, it is actually going to need some support, and that is where AIDC comes in. And we at Lowry have enhanced that AIDC in the IoT uh, with a data capture and abstraction platform, uh, of course, referred to as DCAP. Uh, what we do in all of this and explaining our AIDC toolbox uh, is try and create fit-for-purpose scenarios and blend it into a usable tool that we shall deal with in a moment, the Ohio principle. Next. As I said, we uh, found out some things, and this is my uh, rather amateur way of pretending to be Tom Brady. 78, 55, 15, hup. And what you get is this, 78% of all items in the Internet of Things have no means to identify themselves. 55% of companies claim they have in place uh, some level of Internet of Things activity. 15% would be uh, considered on track. So um, take a look at 
uh, real use cases. Um, these people who claim presence in the Internet of Things who are in some cases indeed there, but when you consider that three quarters of all the items being managed um, have no identity themselves, and one is taken to realize that real use cases, people have 20-year-old barcode scanners, 10-year-old antennas, label material has never been reviewed, uh, tags are not updated, how much more you can use today is far more than you could just 10 years ago. Let's ask ourselves a question. How old is your mobile phone? One year, two year, possibly more, unlikely. Yet that's the same tool set, the same identifier, the same IoT connectivity that your warehouse premises, your logistics, your retail outlet, your healthcare center are running on 2010 at best year old equipment whose long ago legacy proficiency has been replaced by better items. Next. 36, 57, 15, up. And what do we find? 36% of respondents in a recent survey say they have a company-wide intelligent enterprise system. 57% of these report having a vision in place for some level of Internet of Things expansion. 15% of these were. Let's have a look at the scale of that problem. Yes, it's a problem. It's not a play. 78%, in other words, over three quarters of these IoT contents have no reactive or talking identifier. 55% of all companies claim some IoT. And 15 of 55%, in other words, 7.5%, under 10% of businesses are handling themselves in an IoT mode. In other words, it's not really moved along much, is it? 36% say they have a company-wide intelligent enterprise system. 57% have a vision of IoT. That's 57% of 36%. So one-sixth of an enterprise of commerce is actually engaged in IoT in truth to some degree. In other words, if we took the Fortune 1000 list, that's 360 companies at line one, 189 at line two, so just 28 companies in the Fortune 1000 are IoT, shall we say, um, competent, IoT enabled, IOT engaged. Next. Before. Well, before we had AIDC. Um, we had parts, that's equipments, ways and methods, uh, technologies. Um, the first barcode, mid 70s first barcode that I personally was engaged with, 1977. First RFID, 1977. First payment at the pump for gas, 1981. Um, and they were not affordable. Now all AIDC technology is very affordable. Uh, many brands, of course, have paid the ultimate price to be able to deliver as competent AIDC. They're gone. They have either gone bankrupt or they've been absorbed. But the absorption has led to massive progress in AIDC tool sets, along with standards. Standards are fundamental to AIDC. It's why we've been able to create affordable um, AIDC tool sets and why they're so fundamental to IoT enablement because they are standardized even though there are many technologies, many ways, many parts, and not all of them work in every way. For instance, um, you hear the, the one-liners that are classic for describing some AIDC, te te AIDC technologies. Oh, um, you don't need line of sight, or you do need line of sight. Or uh, what about the cumbersome and complex methodology for wiring antennas and wiring RFID readers and creating real-time location systems? Um, so, so much work to be done, but all of this is shrinking by the day, and we have more material to prove that in a moment. 
we always have um, the issues coming up of smart packaging, smart labeling, digital labels, and then fundamental tool that has increased phenomenally in the supply chain today. We try not to use the word supply chain. I'll deal with that in a later slide. But if you consider the vast amount of components and materials and supplies that are now delivered in RTIs, returnable transport items, and it's only recently that TC122 in Workgroup 15, of which I am and my company is a part, have set about trying to formalize a standard for RTIs so that there is true interchangeability, interconnectivity, an absolute pool rather than a notional or owned pool. Let's take a look then at AFTER, if we like. That's the IoT, the Internet of Things. Well, even that phrase proves some challenges because some people would tell you the Internet of Things is clever stuff. It's the, it's the smart fridge that tells you on your phone on the way home to pick up milk or eggs or butter. Um, it is actually far more than that, as everyone on this conversation should be aware of. The Internet of Things is a vision that is constructed around the clear and absolute identification of all and everything everywhere. It is, unfortunately, technobabble. It was coined to replace a perfectly good ordinary word, fulfillment. The whole purpose of the Internet of Things is accelerated, improved, quality defined, quality appropriate, fulfillment. At the moment, IoT has many ill definitions, many definitions that subscribe or proscribe only one element of the IoT. Very useful, of course, your refrigerator, it's nice to have it tell you on the way home, knowing that you're on the way home because it's monitoring your phone or your car, and therefore it knows you're in transit, it knows the direction you're taking, it knows where you're coming, and incidentally, it's probably a driverless car in your lifetime, and uh, even more communicating in an IoT uh, sector. Um, and it says, uh, get you the milk. But isn't it interesting? To get that refrigerator to your house still largely consists of heavy physical and um, uh, human processed uh, actions in order to get it out of the factory, into a truck, out of a truck, into a warehouse, out of a warehouse, into a store, out of the store, into the van, up the stairs, into your kitchen, and turn it on. At which point, of course, suddenly it's an IoT device. But look at all the elements we still have to deal with. Too many elements, in effect. And when you start to ask in the corporate world for some investment, to resolve some of those elements, you're now in the maelstrom of competing capital demands. Do we buy a, a line that makes a fridge faster so that it's more economical to purchase, or do we invest in a more economical means of logistics to get it to the store for a cheaper cost per unit, a lower cost per unit? Those are the questions that IoT throws up every day in our clients and in our community. Next. 50, one, one, Oop. There will be 50 billion devices connected by 2020. If you are to accept that the Internet of Things is at some point and in some of its formats a device connectivity uh, uh, techno bubble speech, then there's 50 billion by 2020. One trillion by 2035. Yet, isn't it interesting to note Gartner, in a recent extract published in Money Map Report, state that only 1% of these devices exist today. So we have got, apparently, to find, um, if my mathematics are roughly correct, 999 billion trillion. Um, I'm, I'm not going to do the maths. I'm just going to say there's a vast amount of these items have yet to be created, have yet to exist. And before anyone goes, oh, yes, but that, that's absolutely silly because um, the, there is no way that there's only 1% of them exist. Yes, there is. If you consider the evolution of uh, wireless devices just in the last 10 years, let's go back 20 and be generous. Um, they evolve 
in yearly increments, as Apple do A, Samsung do B, someone else does C. Um, and only recently did I receive in my email, I'm unfortunately not allowed to uh, divulge it today uh, on this broadcast because it's still being held close and secret, but a device that is truly amazing, that, that is wearable, and that actually monitors you, everything around you, um, talks to you about your voicemail, um, and all done with simple um, gestures of the human body. Um, it is, it, it, I, I just couldn't believe it when I saw it. And what's even more incredible, it is so cheap, it is so low cost, it's a consumer device, and yet it has many industrial applications. So, um, one man's IoT, as I've said, is another man's department. Configuration overload. Extending your AIDC often means, as this slide typifies, if you're going to be part of the one trillion device IoT, that you need to look over your shoulder at your legacy AIDC. When was the last time you reviewed it? And I don't mean by reviewing it you ordered some more of the same. I mean a total AIDC review. What is your current um, barcode implementation? What is your current barcode technology tool? What is your current RFID implementation? Um, and just so that everyone is aware, I will keep mentioning an RFID for the simple reason that the IoT has become RFID's great savior. It has, in fact, accelerated growth in the sector exponentially. There are now publicly quoted companies whose foremost product is RFID. I, even I, as Mr. RFID, could not have envisaged that just 10 years ago. It is, of course, extremely comforting and very good for my wallet, but it also means that you need to look at it again, ask yourself again, is it part of my IoT architecture? Is it what I need to do to make my interfunction um, interoperability model for my IoT better? Is that the continuum in IoT? It's hard, of course, when you enter into the competition for capital, but we recognize that. Lowry have long since created um, a model that allows our clients to uh, participate in our PASS, and um, that's platform as a service. In other words, capturing all that you need in a fast-moving, fast-changing technology world in the AIDC and IoT world that allows you to move forward with confidence that you suddenly won't find yourself blind spy, blindsided by a lack of capital or a lack of resource or a lack of investigation to be able to take hold of this important model. Next. Interesting. Just to add dollars to my uh, facts, McKinsey Global Institute estimate that the IoT will drive as much as $6.2 trillion into the world's economy by 2025. In other words, in eight years' time. Eight years is not a long time. Most people um, have to deal with that eight years um, in, in, in budgeting and budget processes. And again, we're back to competing for capital. So in eight years, are you ready? Have you got what? Next, please. Have you got an IoT culture? Is your IoT culture um, quality, agility, commitment, speed of response, speed of decision? And, and those elements alone requires most companies, and uh, we at Lowry have gone through this process over the last 18 months. We have had a hard look at ourselves and made sure that we can respond for as little point in our briefing, lecturing, supporting, assisting our client base and our partners if we ourselves are unable to demonstrate a quality of deliverable, an agility to meet our clients' ever-changing scenarios, a commitment to them, a speed of response and speed of decisions. These are fundamental. But you've also got to be collaborative and easy to work with. You've got to be easy to do business with. If you notice, when you order something on the internet, when you make um, a, a requirement over the internet, it, it's easy to do. It's why Amazon succeed. 
It's why e-commerce is succeeding. You really don't have to do much at all. Click, click. Um, you've saved your credit card from the last time you bought something. You've saved your address. You've saved the time you wanted shipping, etc. So it's just become easy. It's better than going to the mall. It's and that that transition, that model has to come into your business. It has to be easy to pull parts up to the assembly line, to pick products from the racks, to put products into racks. Are racks necessary? Can we improve in Internet of Things? And it is one of the propositions that is being made. Can we improve our deliverables so that, in fact, we do pass through? Cross-docking in the infinite sense, a parcel going straight through a premise simply to reach another form of delivery or another method of de delivery, the parcel to the consumer or to the manufacturer, to the warehouse, to the end user, it doesn't really matter. We at Lowry are heavily involved in a number of these initiatives that are intended to shrink that footprint and yet increase the efficiency and efficacy of that which should arrive somewhere in fulfillment. You also need premier global partners. First class individuals should be from high quality industry backgrounds. We all have to recognize that one of the challenges in the Internet of Things and in this architecture and what it requires is first class individuals from high quality industry backgrounds are diminishing rapidly because if McKinsey is right and all that money is coming, all that money has to be serviced by individuals, by employees to meet those demands and there just simply are not enough people of that credibility and creditness to do these things. The whole IoT, your IoT culture, has to be cost value and investment conscious. Why? Because IoT in and of itself, the cycle of change, the cycle of technology, not just AIDC, but your IT, what your clients expect, what you're delivering, what your product should cost, um, the competitive elements that surge past you each morning that you wake up. All of this has to be continuously monitored, continuously reviewed. Um, how is it that over the uh, recent years, a CMO has become incredibly important, the chief marketing officer? Uh, marketing is important. Marketing in the e-world, marketing in IoT, using IoT platforms, reaching out in IoT speak is increasingly important. And then the real bad news, IoT is on always. It's, it's uh, so funny. Um, it's worst of all, and yet it's best of all. But here's what's interesting. Um, we're currently, just, just to give you an understanding, people think, ah, yes, but it will be replaced, or all of this AIDC and this IoT, we've got artificial intelligence, we've got robots, we're heading for driverless cars, and AI is going to be the answer, and robots are going to be the answer. Actually, it's not so. Ironically, those devices today function largely because they are either programmed by a human being and left to continue in a rote model, which often goes wrong, or they're actually driven by an AIDC identifier, a data carrier, a barcode, an RFID tag that talks to them and says, hey, I'm a one of those and please put me on a one of these, or take me off a of one of these and put me on one of those, or twist me to the right or twist me to the left. They are messages generated by AIDC tools. Here's, here's a, um, a, shall I say, a funny story for you, right? Um, we are currently supporting one of our clients in being able to place on their IoT consumer device that is smart, intelligent, and does things automatically when the consumer has it, but we're putting an RFID tag on the box so that it can be delivered. Um, you, you see the, the stretch, the, the dimension that IoT is, and yet how dependent it is still on AIDC and their deliverables. Next. This is how we build IoT for our clients and how we think industry should view it. We start with a firmware. All of this comes within our PaaS model, platform as a service. The firmware comes with your AIDC devices, comes with your PLCs, comes with your whatevers. 
And unfortunately, all too often, it's a code that locks it to that particular piece of device, that particular um, uh, electromechanical, physical apparatus. As such, its flexibility is near zero because it only talks and only walks with that particular item. In IoT, you have to have the ability to take all those firmwares from all those different brands and manufacturers and instruction sets and guidance and put them into a bundle. Your middleware. Really? Middle of what exactly? And middling in where? Again, frequently a channel managed middleware. It middlewares for a certain amount or a certain set of deliverables. And do your applications run concurrently? or connected? Are they part of something or part of nothing? And your enterprise, how is it built? Is your enterprise software, is your enterprise data capture model, is your enterprise data processing model ready for the difference in the Internet of Things between ripping a delivery note off a pallet said to contain 48 cases, putting it in an office where it is keyed in, sometimes scanned in, sometimes simply a recognition that it matches the ASN that came in on your EDI interface. Um, all of these things um, today are going to change significantly when you bring in a pallet that instead of being a 96-bit piece of paper that went for paper processing or scan processing in a, in a, um, a batch mode, it's now instant. As that pallet comes through the door, it, that pallet lights up and it says to your system without buffer or interruption, hey, I've just arrived. I am a pallet said to contain 48 cases, each said to contain 24 tins, each of 96 bits of individual record. Here you go, whack. Wow. Most people's enterprise data collection and data management software is unable to cope with that transformation when enacted contemporaneously across more than one location. And finally, of course, we're all dealing, even we in Lowry, and certainly in AIM, with cloud-based software management, cloud tools, etc., which are many prolific and in desperate need of rationalization in many instances. And most people still seem somewhat unaware of the nature of cloud-based IT, um, except the IT department, of course, with all respect. Next. So these are the kinds of wares that we also deal in in the IoT. A core ware that's IT specified, so you will go into certain manufacturing companies and they will tell you that they only use X hardware in their IT platform. And baseware, only that particular baseware, meaning an enterprise platform, an SAP, an Oracle, whatever. Firmware, oh, that's included, yes, but is it suitable? Does it help? Does it support? Does it, does it expand? Is it elastic? Is it um, efficient? And serviceware, which is operation specified often and does clever things like order up a truck or uh, engage a delivery service, yes, but the operations did that and they did it in conjunction with a carrier, and they used the carrier serviceware, which is not necessarily linked, and in the IoT it must be, to the deliverable itself. And utilityware, which apparently does everything, and we've come across several examples of something that supposedly does everything, but their everything is not everything. It's only their everything. Very dangerous. And the middleware, the middle of who? But edgeware, IoT edgeware, that's what hangs it all together, and we will return to this subject momentarily. Next. Here's the key. There is nothing without Ohio. Everything that we conduct in Lowry and increasingly across the industry must adhere to zero human intervention operations because that's successful cost-effective Internet of Things. Now, we do not mean labor force reduction. That is not the job of AIDC, of AIM, or of Lowry Solutions. What we refer to is the more efficient use of AIDC, AIDC technology to deliver successful Internet of Things. Um, what and how labor is recognized and utilized going forward 
There will still be many, many roles, many of them, and they will not be replaced overnight or even over a decade. However, how things are produced and how things are managed and fulfilled in the fulfillment cycle is based on the Ohio principle. Next. Now please listen. We're getting down to the meat of this. We're getting to the part that really matters that I hope when these are published, and incidentally, these presentations will be uh, hosted onto the AIM and Lowry sites uh, by Monday, and you are free to download them at your pleasure if you find any one or more of the slides to be of value. You may also, as Michael will mention, reach out to us. So next, please. This is the IoT pyramid. This is the Internet of Things building block. At the bottom, your client, interestingly enough, at the top, your industry. Both have to be guarded. To your left, information security, and to your right, information integrity. You are all aware that one of the great challenges to the Internet of Things, to the connectivity models that we embrace and face, is unfortunately hacking and cyber theft and cyber fraud. And we're only just coming to terms with these, but we are. And so long as you remember that they must be the guardians to the left and right of your pyramid, you're in good order. As each of these fall into place, you, you move to a virtual enterprise, a lower cost agile engine, your MRP, ERP, WMS, your value chain integration. is all, interestingly enough, those systems don't exist without an AIDC tool set. Your MRP requires data to be provided to it in one form or another, largely speaking in this day and age, in a barcode. So you're not actually adrift from it. It's just at this moment in time, it's buried inside this machination of MRP, ERP, WMS value, and it should be at the top of your pyramid. It should be hosting those elements below AIDC technology. You need integrated information. You need integrated information security. You need integrated information security and asset management in your enterprise in order to deliver the product to your client from your industry. Your client is holding up your pyramid. Next. Value chain has technology enablers from the AIDC community. And in those, they are identification standards, data carriers, and electronic commerce. I have kept this slide very basic because these are, as anyone will tell you, legacy uh, models. They're not today's, up-to-date, today's um, second and third generation barcode uh, uh, acronyms but they are indicative of many which are extant and normative in value chain management, and they are that which has brought us to today to enable us to approach the Internet of Things. Next. Let's take an example of another analysis methodology that we apply in creating um, Internet of Things uh, for our clients and for the membership of AIM. FTD, Frequency Technology and Data. Let's take RFID and AIDC toolset as an example. There's 17 pieces of radio spectrum usable in short-range devices. That's RFID's technical description. The technology today comes from around about 150 different companies each manufacturing IoT-aligned RF devices, tags, and related hardware. But you know, at the end of the day, and I hope we're getting that message across, the only thing we're after is data, because data is what drives us. There's many different data values. Not all of them are self-evident when generated, and not a surprisingly low amount of them are actually harvested with value in um, an AIDC IoT environment, and particularly in RFID, which is able to hold so much more than um, a normal data carrier. So, let's uh, next. 
There's a second side to FTD, frequency technology and data. We assess the frequency of a report of event cycles in AIDC tools. It should not come as a surprise that the IoT can accept and expect a much higher incidence of reporting, much higher event uh, notification, event cycles. And it wants to be told if those things don't happen. Normatively, legacy, we only tell people what happened. We do not actually report what didn't happen. We need the frequency of those instances. What's the frequency of the reporting cycle? And, and what do we do when we look at that? We take the metric by which AIDC technology takes up responsibility and redundancy management of any part of that logistic. And finally, the data load of the overall architecture, ensuring that sizing locally, campus-wide and cross-campus IT traffic and integrity is maintained. Isn't it interesting that in this most important element, how much the cost of service has been reduced over the past few years and how much more, how much larger they are, how much more um, uh, compact and efficient they are, and how many more you can put into a rack or a box or a room or whatever. This is because the IoT expects that kind of data crunching, data processing, etc. Next. Identification numbers, of course, is all there is to do with anything. They link products, attributes, and messages. We know that we've expanded our uh, uh, internet uh, numbering system so that we can add trillions of new addresses. In fact, the extent to which they're being added is that there will be a million addresses for each grain of sand upon Earth within a few years. This is fabulous, but you've got to process them. And first of all, you've got to get them. You've got to get them from some methodology that carries that number, which has an attribute, which provides a message. It goes into databases, it becomes a transaction set, old style EDI, ASNs, but coming soon to somewhere near you, blockchain. We're not going to talk about blockchain today, but we're hoping to engage another webinar in the new year that will start to address the challenges of blockchain that is going to hit you not in 10 years or 50 years. You have 50 years to absorb barcode. You've had 15 to absorb RFID, five on RTLS. You've got a couple of years to create a blockchain architecture and to comply with blockchain delivery models. Next. What have we dealt with? What are we trying to do? What's the desired outcome for an Internet of Things development? Obviously, as you will hopefully have perceived, you've got to go out and find best of breed AIDC technology. That in must include future proofing, must include diverse technologies. One AIDC technology is not enough, nor will it do everything you want. One piece of RFID is not enough, and nor will it do everything you want. And one barcode may not satisfy all of your barcoding requirements. Just like if you ship internationally, one language on the side of your packet is likely to get your product seized at the port of destination because you did not label it in Mandarin, you did not label it in French or German or Spanish. You have to have state-of-the-art systems. You must achieve operational excellence. What is operational excellence? Varies from place to place. Depends on what your operation is. Depends how much of it is in line with or violates the Ohio principle. You're building a world-leading reputation. Your company's overarching image is reflected in the ability for you to be part of the Internet of Things and to match your AIDC technology with other people's AIDC technologies to provide seamless communication and absolute fulfillment which leads to your stakeholder satisfaction. Stakeholders are not just those who own a piece of your company. They are those who buy a piece of your company in the form of the products you make and deliver. Next. We will, as I said earlier, return at a later date and talk of Lowry Chain and blockchain. Uh, right now, next. I thank everybody for listening, and I pass you back to our convener, Michael, 
who I believe may or may not have some questions. I would fully appreciate if there are none because it's that time of the day and I can almost smell the delicate aroma of roasting turkey in the background. Thank you all so much for listening. Michael, take it away. Thank you, John, for the great presentation. And we did receive a few questions uh, for our AIM webinar Q&A session. Uh, would you like to go over those now? Yes, sir. All right, great. Uh, so going back to one of your earlier slides, you said uh, about 1% existing. Uh, and they were asking how many is the 1%? In other words, if 1 trillion devices will be connected in 2035 or by 2035 and only 1% exists today, how many is that 1%? Yes, a, 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 actually a marvelous question, and, and here's the bad news. I don't know. John Greaves does not know everything. What John Greaves did was take the word of authority of those who survey and analyze and accept that 1%. But let's, let's do some sort of indirect mathematics. The answer is not many. If I was to take, you know, um, in, in AIDC devices, all that has ever been delivered, uh, barcode scanners, handheld terminals, um, RFID equipment in HF, UHF, 125 kilohertz, 433. You know, I'm going to guess that there's not a lot, right? Um, I believe, for instance, if you, if you take this, RFID tags, UHF, last year, um, crossed 10 billion produced and sold worldwide. But they're not really a device. They're, they're part and parcel of the consumable side. That would be like saying, you know, um, uh, sticky labels with human readable on and adding them to the number. So if I go back now and I say, well, how many readers, scanners uh, were sold? The answer is frankly not a lot. It's in the millions, of course, worldwide. And it's been greatly enhanced, but then you've got to be careful again because um, there would be some confusion if you consider Apple Pay a, an AIDC tool set, but it's on your Apple phone as an app that you downloaded from the Apple Store. And the same with any other e-payment system that is done with your telephone. Is that one of those devices? Uh, probably. But again, it goes back to an earlier slide as well, Michael. And the questioner, whoever you were, thank you very much for the question. Um, what is the IOT? Are you in IIOT or IOTC, Internet of Things for Consumers? So, um, nutshell, usual me, too long an answer to, I don't know. Well, thank you for that. I do appreciate it. Um, and if you still have questions, you can still get those in. Just use the uh, chat icon on the top right of your screen, enter it in, and we can answer that for you. Another question we did receive is, what is NFC's role in the IoT? Oh, again, you see, this is, this is superb. Um, NFC is, is, in my opinion, in the opinion of myself and others, um, has been one of the most um, formidable, lucrative, uh, and frankly, well-performed um, interfaces developed in AIDC. It's, of course, largely speaking, 1356 technology. As a person who was one of the founding members of SC31, the ISO Standards Group, and was engaged with SC31 and SC17, banking and finance, from which NFC standards came in the form of 15963, which changed to 15693 when it went to industry standard. Um, uh, there's there's a, a whole play of numbering goes on there, which I won't bore you with. But in a nutshell, um, near field communications forms an integral part of many aspects of the Internet of Things. In a consumer world, as payment tools, in the industrial world, it's used in many locations where short-range reads of, in inches is adequate for the purpose being used. Um, in its financial model, however, 
it faces, it is one of the earliest uh, items that may well face a pretty swift transformation from um, not existing, existing to legacy. Why? Blockchain. And that's all I have to say today, otherwise I'll steal my thunder next year, Michael. <laughs> Another question we did receive is, can a barcode be considered part of the IoT since it is monodirectional? Yes. Next. <laughs> Thank you. What industries adopt IoT slash RFID technologies the most? Otherwise, what is repeatable use cases for our IoT RFID? Wow. Um, just a moment, pause for thought. Okay, I do not know of one industry today who has not and is not knocking on our door or our competitors, of which we have a few, um, and asking the question, can I have a repeatable usable RFID tool set to meet my IoT requirements. And that's the way the question is, you see, Michael. It's not, does RFID go knock on the IoT door and say, here you are, mate, got one of these for you, fix your IoT, it will. Well, no, it's the other way around. And yes, uh, we ourselves have an increasing library of repeatable, doable, affordable, deliverable deployments that meet IoT criteria. We are particularly active in manufacturing, particularly active in returnable transport items, in transportation associated with both of the above. Um, we find healthcare uh, becoming very much part and parcel um, healthcare is almost a bridge between IOTC and IIoT. It's almost a perfect bridge. You've got both ends of the equation. If you can find a way to connect those both ends, and RFID is likely the best medium to do that in one or more of its forms, remember I've always said there's no single um, utopian piece of RF spectrum that will solve all, but RF as an industry, as a sector, can certainly solve all given that the client is willing to understand the variances and the nuances, just like many people still have a barcode they use in-house and a barcode they put on to go out-house. All That's right, it. and that actually wraps it up for our Q&A session. So thank you again, John, for your insight and knowledge and for providing us with this presentation today. Thank you again, and thank you to everybody. Do enjoy your holiday. Have a nice day. Yes, thank you, everyone, and have a great day.